Welcome back. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about three different kinds of entrepreneurial processes. Causation, effectuation, and articulation. And kind of the way that we'll structure this video is we'll look at the comparing and contrasting aspects of causation and effectuation. And the understandings of causation and effectuation that I'm using draw from Saras Sarasvati. So I'm, I'm uh, using her interpretations of causation and effectuation. Now when we finish our discussion of causation and effectuation, I'll introduce you to a third process known as articulation. And this is the article that I recommend the most written by Saras Vathy. It's causation and effectuation toward a theoretical shift from economic inevitability to entrepreneurial contingency. And as we're going through this, let me stick this over here. And as we're going through this particular article, or excuse me, as we're going through this particular video, I'll read just a couple of key passages uh, from this article. I don't like to read a lot uh, as I go through these videos word for word. But I think Sarah Svathi's uh, particular phrasing of some certain problems is extremely important. And therefore, um, I really want to, to use her words and provide some additional commentary on it. So let's start off with the history of kind of our, our thinking of causation. Causation is probably the number one model of entrepreneurial process that you will learn about in a business school or business school setting. And let's kind of think about why that would be. The answer, of course, will be at the end of the video, but I just want you to think about it. So let's talk about the history of it. First and foremost, causation builds on deduction. Deduction is the same kind of thinking that you learn in probably your high school or college uh, biology or science classes. Okay? Deduction says, I know exactly what I want at the end, and I'm going to come up with hypotheses to test whether I can get my final end or not. So looking at causation, you basically know what you want or your final end goal is. And you can look at this in terms of the ends of a firm. And the normal ends of a firm that we describe are profit, growth, social, environmental. These are normally said what the ends of the firm are. Now, I can see Sarah Svathy probably disagreeing with me and saying, well, no, these are generalized ends. And that's absolutely a correct assessment. Part of it is because I'm citing her article, but part of it is I need to give you a little bit more clarification of what I'm doing. And some of you have been making bets on if I use orange or colored chalk, will I get it on my white shirt? And it's not looking very promising. I guess you have to watch the end of the video to determine whether the shirt stays white or, or, or not by the end. But anyhow, when we talk about profit, growth, social, or environmental, we need to be very specific in order for us to actually be talking about causation. So, for example, if we're talking about profit, we wouldn't talk about a general profit, but we'd say, I want to make $10,000 profit at the end of the year. See, that's very specific. I want to grow 15% above my current capacity, very specific. I want to solve hunger in East Los Angeles, specific. And I want to do something like with the Green New Deal, um, get rid of pollution in you know, all of this county. That's quite specific. So it focuses on the ends. Okay. Now, let's go just a little bit further into this discussion here, and then we'll start comparing to effectuation. Causation builds a lot from traditions of Austrian economics. Now, 
Austrian economists are the ones who are generally credited with popularizing the study of entrepreneurship. You've got guys like Schumpeter, von Mises, Hayek, uh, Lachman maybe to um, a lesser extent. And they basically look at the world in terms of a supply and demand curve. Yeah, you've all seen these in economics. If I need to do videos on this in more detail, I can, but you know, at least for purposes of this video, you've got a nice supply and demand curve with your equilibrium point here. Now, if we look at this from an Austrian economics perspective, we would say that this equilibrium is temporarily out of balance. Okay? So, we have a different... might have a different supply or demand curve, you know, things are kind of out of sync, um, or maybe you've got movement along a particular supply and demand curve, um, you know, however you look at it, for whatever reason, equilibrium has not occurred, okay? And so the theory is that an astute or a perceptive or an exceptionally intelligent entrepreneur can perceive these imbalances, they create a business, they create an organization, and then they restore that process of equilibrium, and in that process of restoring equilibrium, they make a profit. That's the key precept of Austrian economics, and that's the key precept of causation. Let me further elaborate here. I'll give an example uh, from kind of my personal, personal life. I like bourbon in general. I'm only recommending bourbon for those of you over the age of 21. But I happen to like bourbon. There is a particular bourbon that is not particularly expensive, but it's made in rather limited quantities, and it's a little bit hard to get. It's a little bit hard to to find it and purchase it. And so you know you get a relationship with the liquor store, and you have them call you right away uh, when they get you know that one bottle in, and they hold you hold that one bottle, and you have to drive an hour to get it. Um, it's worth it, by the way. Um, but anyhow, I was talking to my dad, and I said, hey, it would be really cool. Because it used to be you could go to bourbon distillers, and you could buy an entire barrel of bourbon. Now, they would ship you know, the full barrel to you. you know, they put it in bottles and everything. But you get all the bourbon out of a barrel. I said, hey, Dad, wouldn't it be cool if we could go to one of the distilleries and buy a couple barrels of this bourbon? Then we get a liquor license and we sell it at an elevated price. Well, this is essentially what you call arbitrage. Okay. Arbitrage. In other words, you perceive an imbalance in the market and you make a profit from it. So what I'm saying is that there is a greater demand for this bourbon than the quantity supplied. And so what I can do is get some of that bourbon and have my own supply, and because the demand is so great, I can make and charge a price that is above what the market is currently bearing. So, and then I kind of restore that economic um, uh, equilibrium and make a profit, right? And we've all experienced arbitrage at some point in our life. I remember in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago, I was walking around, and it was a really hot day, um, and it was like, nothing in sight in terms of somewhere to get, you know, something to eat or drink. And there, were, there was this, like, random guy out of nowhere opens up an ice cooler, and he's um, asking people to buy Cokes. And it was, like, $5 for a can of Coke, right? Like a, a normal size can, right? You know, the kind of can that's, you know, I don't know, 20, 25 cents if you go buy it at a, a Costco or Sam's Club or whatever. Now, you know, not much money, but he was charging 5 bucks, arbitraging. Because, let's face it, there was no coke in the area, and people wanted it. So he was kind of taking advantage of some sort of a disequilibrium at that moment. So people in Austrian economics look at disequilibrium, and the whole purpose of entrepreneurship is to generate equilibrium. Okay? Of course, as Schumpeter would say, um, we'll talk about creative destruction in another video if you want more detail uh, on this Give me a, leave me a comment and I'll, and I'll make a special video on that. But you know we're using kind of a simple 
causation, effectuation, articulation discussion. Um, but you know, again, looking at deduction, okay, I believed that the market was out of equilibrium. I start a business to test my hypothesis, and you know, my being right or wrong would determine um, or validate my hypothesis or not. That is the deductive piece of causation. Now, another piece that we need to look at here, and this is one thing about Schumpeter that I'll talk about, is that Schumpeter would call them heroic, right? Heroic entrepreneurs are exceptionally smart. They're brilliant people who can perceive these, uh, or unusually perceptive, who can uh, perceive these kind of disequilibriums in supply and demand curves. Okay? And another thing that goes along with this heroic entrepreneur right, is risk. Okay? Now, we have all experienced risk. No, I'm, I'm not talking about that board game that I find extremely lame that we used to play when I was 10 years old. Not that one. I'm talking about calculating risk. Okay? So you probably took these in like high school algebra classes where you'd have like a, a word problem. You got like a jar. Okay, I can't draw, that's why I do entrepreneurship and not art. Uh, but you got these, you know, this is, this is supposed to be a jar. And you got like a blue marble here, blue marble here. These are supposed to be marbles, I know they're not round. Trying, work with me here. Okay, some orange ones. two purple ones. We're breaking the rule today, right? Okay. So we got some different marbles in here. And so the point of risk is that I can calculate a discrete probability here of, you know, what's the probability of me getting a purple marble versus an orange marble versus a blue marble. And, you know, if I'm smart enough or perceptive enough, I can know exactly what the rules are and I can decide which or what level of risk I am comfortable with. So I can actually calculate this, all right? The probability of my success is 50% in this given entrepreneurial venture, and I know that it's 50% because I'm a really, really smart Austrian economics style entrepreneur. I am Mr. Causation, okay? Another key component of causation is the fact that because you work with risk, right? Because you know what the odds of success are, you know that endpoint, and so what you do instead is you mobilize a variety of means okay, to achieve that given end. Of course, what are the means of the firm? Those of you who watch my channel regularly probably have already seen a couple of videos that I look at on this. But you've got the means of a firm. No, we're not talking about mean like that kid on the school bus. We're actually talking about means. Okay? Means would be resources. I'm going to enter a new market. It says culture under know how. Let's see if I can move that down a little bit. Sorry about that. Okay, how's that? So it says culture down here. Now you can see it. Um, so basically, what I'm going to do is I know that I want to start the next big firm, the next big thing. So I'm going to mobilize financial resources of the firm the infrastructure of the firm, the organizational structure, the know-how in the office, and little aspects of my uh, culture, I'm within the firm, I mean, a firm culture, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know exactly what I want, and I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get those things, and I'm gonna mobilize them, and I'm gonna put them together, okay? Again, like my arbitrage and bourbon example, right? I knew what I wanted. I wanted to start selling bourbon once I got my liquor license, okay? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna ask Dad, hey, can I have some money? I'm gonna take some of my own personal savings, I'm going to start using my own personal network. I'll do a little bit of my own marketing, and I'll use, like, I don't know, the space in my garage, 
and with all that kind of those things that I have gathered together to support that final endpoint of actually selling bourbon. Okay. Mr. Causation, in my opinion, is MacGyver. And I'm not talking about the MacGyver that's on TV now. I haven't even watched that show. Those of us that grew up in the 80s, there's only one MacGyver, and that's Richard Dean Anderson. I'm talking about that MacGyver. Okay? He knew that you know he's like stuck in like a burning car or something, and he's locked in, and he needs to get out. You see, that's a goal. Okay? He knows he's got to get out. So what does he do? He looks around the car, and he says, well, I'm going to take you know, a thimble, a to a, some toenail clippers, and a stick piece of chewing gum, and I'm going to blow the door off the, the, the vehicle, and I'm going to get out alive. Right? So you see, he had a, a very solid endpoint. And then he kind of combined those things, um, and it, you know, combine those uh, means into kind of a new way um, in order to get out of the car. Okay. Now, I'm going to borrow a little bit from Sarah Svathi's article as we get into our discussion of effectuation. So when we know the, when we know, or we think we know what the future is, we know what our goals are we can do analysis and we can kind of control it, right? But Sir Spence says, well, here's some questions um, that causation would not really be able to answer, okay? How do we make pricing decisions when a firm does not yet exist, i.e., no revenue functions or cost functions are given? Or, even more interesting, when the market for the product or service does not yet exist, i.e., there is no demand function. Geez, I can do all the analysis I want, but it's just a lot of conjecture, isn't it? Now, we'll discuss isomorphism in some other articles. And, you know, those, those are some possible answers, but we'll talk about that in another video. How do we hire somebody for an organization that does not yet exist? How do we even get people to apply to a contingent organization, an organization whose existence is contingent upon acquiring employees? Think of like the software firms in Silicon Valley, right? You're trying to sell people on a brand new hot idea. This could be a challenge. How do we value firms or assign a value to firms in an industry that did not exist five years ago and is barely forming in the present? So it's a brand new industry, so you don't really know. More interesting, how do we have valued them five years ago when internet companies were barely emerging? Interesting question. And we're saying, well, internet companies barely emerging five years ago. You have to remember this article is from 2001. And I like this. At a macro level, how do we create a capitalist economy from a formerly communist one? Or, more interesting, what should a post-capitalist economy look like? Questions that are way beyond what causation can answer. So for that, we come to the theory of effectuation. And this is Sarah Spathy's big contribution. When we think of Sarah Spathy, we think of effectuation. This is her, her theory. So, in contrast to causation, Effectuation is inductive. There's no hypothesis testing here. Oops. We are very much going by the seat of our pants. We are not testing hypotheses. We're kind of saying, hey, you know, I'll just kind of feel it out, fly by the seat of my pants, kind of see what happens, and I'll just kind of interact to the environment as it hits me. Right? And I'll just kind of theorize on the fly. Okay? Now, there's two ways of looking at effectuation here. You could say that it builds very much like resource-based view, and I've got a video on that uh, on my channel if you'd like to watch it. Um, I'll put the link in the description of this video. So you could say that effectuation is very much like the resource-based view of the firm, in that you are recombining the means of the firm in new and different ways. However, Sarah Spathy does not look at the means of the firm because, remember, we're talking about entrepreneurs, not firms. Okay, not, we're not talking about corporate strategy. We're talking about entrepreneurship. So she would look at the firms as related to the person, the entrepreneur. So you'd say, who am I? What do I know? Whom do I know? And 
possibly even what are my knowledge corridors. So it's very much inward looking. Instead of looking out in the market for an opportunity, you're saying, hey, let me combine my own kind of personal means in some sort of a new and innovative way, and that's how I generate entrepreneurship. Okay? So let's look at this. It's not about arbitrage, it's more about art. Now, I'm, I gave MacGyver as an example um, earlier as Mr. Causation. Well, Effectuation, and I've mentioned this before, like on my resource-based view, uh, view video, effectuation is almost like a Bob Ross kind of thing. And if you don't know Bob Ross, you're missing out on life. He had kind of like this big curly hair and his awesome show on PBS where he would paint, right? And so Bob Ross, it's who he is. He's an artist. What does he know? He knows how to paint. Um, of course, that adds a means resources. He has paint, too. Who does he know? He knows some people from PBS who are willing to put him on TV. And what are his knowledge uh, corridors? You know, he has uh, good networks and you know, all these kind of things together. And you re kind of recombine that. And so what it, the result is, is Bob Ross is on TV with his canvas. And he says, I don't know what I'm going to do. He has this really soothing voice. I don't know what I'm going to do today. Oh, I'm just going to paint this. Oh, you know, I made a mistake here. There's no mistakes, just happy accidents. So with a quick flick of my wrist, that cloud is going to become a tree. right? And that's kind of how he would work. Okay. So it's all about what you can do and what you think is the way forward for you. So if I were to use maybe a personal example, okay, I consider this channel very much an example of effectuation and action. Okay, so who am I? I am a professor of entrepreneurship. What do I know? I know entrepreneurship and I know the research. Okay, you might also ask. Um, one I also have my students. What can I do? Of course, I'd add here, I have time, I have a computer, I have a webcam, I paid for this microphone. I don't know if it's working right now. Hopefully it is. Who do I know? I know all of you, my audience, my YouTube subscribers, students that I have in class that are watching this, hopefully. Okay? Same thing. And what can I do? I can sit up here and I can dance around and try to be entertaining. So what do I do? I recombine those, and then Dr. D University channel on YouTube. Okay. So do I really? Did I really do any sort of external analysis before I started this channel? No. In fact, did I even know exactly what I wanted when I started this YouTube channel? No. And that's an important piece in Sarah Spathy's uh, reasoning: is that unlike causation, where you start with a very specific end, you start with a generalized aspiration. I have a generalized aspiration that I want to help people through free educational videos. And then I take my means and I just kind of mi mix and mash them together. Okay. Another piece that we've got, then our causation entrepreneurs are pretty heroic types. Our effectuation ones really aren't that heroic. I mean, you give the example of curry in a hurry that Sarah Spathy uses in her article. I mean, this is very much like, like a bubbly Indian lady who has a lot of enthusiasm and she just kind of, she tries a little bit of this, you know, um, one kind of restaurant, and it winds up being, you know, delivery, and then, you know, in tours in India and cultural excursions, and she's just kind of going. She's like an artist going by the seat of her pants. And furthermore, in contrast to managing risk, we shoot for uncertainty. Uncertainty. And risk and uncertainty are quite different. So risk, we know exactly what the odds of being successful are. Uncertainty, on the other hand, we don't. In fact, we don't even know if there's marbles in this jar at all. So what you do instead is you make up your own game. You say, you know what, how about I just put, what if I just take all these marbles out, throw them away, and I start putting white marbles in there and make up my own game. Just kind of doing my own thing. That's how uncertainty works. Okay, you don't know what the future is at all, so you just kind of do your own thing and go with it. Now, one thing that I want you to remember next: think of it like the Matrix. Okay, 
awesome movie in my uh, very biased opinion. And you remember when Morpheus has a red pill and a blue pill to hand to Neo? Well, if he took the blue pill, he would remain that hacker known as Neo. And he would be very much causation. He would know all about his world and be a great hacker and all that kind of stuff. But because he took the red pill, he actually becomes Mr. Effectuation, right? He doesn't know what the future will hold. So he bends the present to match, uh, to match himself. Okay? And so I just want to read a couple things in Sarah Fathy's article that I think are important uh, to illustrate the very different kinds of trains of thought in causation and effectuation. Effectuation focuses on affordable loss rather than expected returns. In other words, under causation, you can calculate how much profit, growth, social impact, or environmental stuff that you're going to do, right? Under effectuation, it's, you know, I'm going to just kind of mix and match things, and you know what? How much loss am I willing to accept before I get out of this given industry? And of course, hopefully... Um, you could also say, how much expected gain do I want to have? But you really don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a generalized aspiration. I want to be rich. I want to be happy. I want to, you know, something kind of fun. Versus, I want to drive a Ferrari and I want to make $250,000 a year. Very different, right? Strategic alliances rather than competitive analysis. In other words, under causation, you focus on what the competition is doing. And you might want to watch my, por my video on Portarian uh, view of strategy, or and also I have one on Portarian rents. Okay? You focus on what the competition is doing, and then you react accordingly. Again, you're functioning in a supply and demand curve. Whereas effectuation would ask the question, well, how can I work with people in my environment? Think of like a stakeholder model. I've got a video on that on my channel too. How can I work with my stakeholders in order to get, you know, a bigger share of an increasingly larger market. Um, and actually, I think if you look at my discussion on the embedded view of strategy, that's very much an understanding of effectuation. You think about like in Japan, they're very good with effectuation-based uh, uh, strategies. They work with their suppliers. They form alliances with their suppliers. They work with their competitors in order to get larger pieces of an ever-expanding market share. So by working together, everybody has more. Okay. There's a French expression, actually. When you, cut the, when you cut the loaf in two, everybody has more. That's very much uh, an effectuation piece, right? Um, exploitation of contingencies rather than exploitation of pre-existing knowledge. In other words, pre-existing knowledge is based on my market analysis. I'm going to be X, Y, and Z successful. This is, you know what? Let's just see what happens. And I'll just kind of deal with reality as it comes. I'll react accordingly. And that's how I'm going to make my success. I'm not going to go in with much of a, a very robust plan. I'll just accept things as they are. I'll react. I'll adjust. And I'll conquer. Okay? And then you've got um, controlling an unpredictable future rather than predicting an uncertain one. In other words... Again, thinking about this jar of marbles. I can try to predict a somewhat uncertain future, or I can make the future my own, and therefore I can control it. Controlling the future versus predicting it. Making my own path versus functioning or playing according to someone else's rules. This is the big debate in causation and effectuation. Now we're going to talk about articulation. Okay, in My own research that I do. I'm going to delete these, erase these a little bit here. All right. Now, I have a very different view of what an entrepreneur is. I look at an entrepreneur as a storyteller, as a communicator, someone that can translate something very vague, like a generalized aspiration, and then kind of spit it out to an audience and convince them to come along for the ride. Now, this understanding of entrepreneurship builds quite heavily on Plato's theory of forms. 
So if we accept a given value or form okay, that's out there, and what I mean by a form, a form is an abstraction of moral, mathematical, or logical thought. No one's ever seen a form, and no one ever will, and if you did see a form, it would cease to be a form, by definition. Examples of forms include a perfect circle. Nobody's ever seen a perfect circle. Nobody ever will. But think of also things like being loved. You know, really, what does that even mean exactly? We're always kind of continuously revising and refining definitions of things like love or, or courage. What is courage? Is courage the ability to stand up for yourself? Or is it to fight a bully? Or is it to face death? Uh, I don't know. The one thing we know about values, though, is we know what they aren't, right? If someone behaves in an underhanded manner, we would say that is not courage, right? If someone feels degraded, we could say that is not love. But yet we cannot define exactly what love is, okay? This would be like a value. Okay? Now, on the outskirts of this model, got, I use this as a generalized depiction of what I might call the context. Okay. Context is your environment at any given time, it's your customers, it's your friends, your family, it's the people that you interact. An entrepreneur. Now I'm going to draw that as a square. You see, I've got these circles. So what I want to emphasize with these things that it looks like a solar system, doesn't it? That's that's my choice, uh, deliberately by design, because I want to emphasize that an entrepreneur can move along this circle. The context can move along this circle, and in fact, they could even move up and down. The circles could overlap, interact, etc. So an entrepreneur needs to figure out how to create the shortest distance and perfect alignment between that entrepreneur's vision and the context. So if the entrepreneur's hanging out here, he sees a context over here. What he, he or she needs to do is get perfect alignment there. Or alternatively, the entrepreneur would need to move So this all sounds hunky-dory in terms of theory, right? But what does it actually mean in practice? Well, what an entrepreneur does is they tell a story. Stories are a way to get people to move. So by telling a good pitch, by articulating a certain vision, you are essentially articulating an opportunity. So causation very much says that you discover an entrepreneurial opportunity out there in the environment. And effectuation says you very much create an opportunity through looking kind of inside. Articulation says it's actually not, an opportunity is not a thing to be discovered or created but rather it's a moment of, of alignment. It's a moment in time, right? An entrepreneur has to be able to tell a good, mutually reflexive story. What is a mutually reflexive story? Well, have you ever been in that situation where your dad's reading to you and you tell him, I don't like the way that story ends. Can you change it? And your dad's like, eh, yeah, whatever. And he kind of changes it on the fly and then closes the book and gets the kid to go to bed, right? That's what I mean by a mutually reflexive story. If you as an entrepreneur tell a great story that you think is great and the customers don't think it's great, well, guess what? It's not really that great of a story, is it? So, um, where was I going with that train of thought? That's how you know these are kind of spontaneous videos. Oh, right. So that's where the entrepreneur can move. You know, the entrepreneur says, wouldn't it be great if I could get 
these people, this company, this country on board with me, but they're not really going to move for a variety of reasons. So it's contingent on you as the entrepreneur to adjust and adjust in such a way that it tells a coherent story and aligns up with your values and their values. So articulation is very much a process of translation. It's translating something very abstract into something very concrete, something that makes a lot of sense. Now, the entrepreneur can also get the context to move with him. You know, this would, wouldn't it be really cool if, and you're like, yeah, that'd be really cool. And then they buy into your story. You've essentially sold them and you have, you have created that degree of alignment. Now, of course, alignment doesn't always last. People get tired of your product, they buy the product, they move on. For whatever reason, you know, they shift. And then that opportunity slowly starts to dissipate and it's not really a good opportunity. You know, one example that I always think of, when I was a little boy one time, uh, I don't know how little I was, I probably wasn't even that little, I was probably 12 or 13. Anyhow, they had this commercial on TV and it was for this thing called Phone Free. And these were back in the days when you had to pay for I guess I did get chalk on that. All right. Um, you had to pay for phone. You had, see, I got all distracted and worked about the chalk. Um, you had to pay for um, long-distance telephone calls, and you paid by like the minute or something. So this thing called phone free, where you could call people long distance through the Internet, and it didn't cost any more than the regular Internet calls. I thought this was pretty cool, although at the time the context was back here because internet was still kind of a developing technology. And I said, I looked at my mom and I said, whoa, mom, that's great. You can call your sister and not have to pay for it because she's out of state. So I said, I tried to convince and shift, right? And my mom looked at me and she said, no fool, nobody would ever pay for a service or nobody would ever use a service that made telephone calls through the internet. So essentially, I failed to articulate that that was a valid opportunity. Right? But imagine, you know, the internet kind of develops, bam, 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 we're getting kind of closer. And then guess what happens when I'm in my late 20s? I say, hey, mom, there's this really cool service called Skype, and we can call each other webcam, even though I'm living in Korea and you're still living in California. And she says, wow, that sounds pretty cool. You see, I was able to tell a better story and one that made a little bit more uh, sense to her based on kind of the, the context at the time. If you have any questions on articulation, basically what I have done is I've taken about 3,000 years of philosophy and I've tried to condense into a six-minute discussion. So feel free to post any comments uh, down in the comments section. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. Um, post any comments that you have. I'll, I'll definitely answer them. And please subscribe. I, I really appreciate the feedback that I get from you, the YouTube community. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, if you guys have any particular subjects you'd like me to talk about, put those in the comments, too. I'm always kind of looking for feedback from my audience. All right, now I really am shutting off. Thanks.